Hey, Shalom, Sister Kate here. Long time no see. It's been a while since I did a video. We've been really, really, really busy, so that's the main excuse. I don't think Pastor and I ate dinner till what, almost 9 o'clock last night? Yeah. Because we had a hoot down at Bear's Place for the opening day of Sukkot, along with a bunch of other saints, and it was, it was a really fun time. Yeah, it was good. Lots of talking, spiritual um, battles, all sorts of things going on down there. And so then we spent the night in our temporary shelter, and here we are the next morning. We're kind of taking it a little bit easy. Oh, yeah. Well, Sukkot's supposed to be like an end of the harvest festival. It's supposed to be joyous. It's supposed to be uh, an enjoyable, restful a bit. Um, and praise the Lord. So hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for being who you are and that you picked us, chose us to open our eyes and put our feet on your path. Anyway, I was looking at the news last night or this morning and, you know, there's some top stories happening right now, which is always true. There's the typhoon in Japan that killed some people and did some damage. Um, the Rugby World Cup is in Japan right now, which... I'm thoroughly interested in because I used to play rugby in college. I played rugby in college for two and a half years. Women's rugby, not men's rugby. Um, and so I'm finding that fascinating. Uh, so I watch that sometimes. But the thing I want to talk about this morning that's a news story is the uh, hemorrhagic African swine flu that is being spread around Asia, and I'm assuming parts of Africa, I'm assuming that's why they named it that, um, because there's some things to look at with a hemorrhagic flu and also a swine flu. Hemorrhagic means bleeding, basically. Um, the, it, it, the illness weakens the blood vessels, the walls of them, and so there is blood leakage, and Ebola is one of those hemorrhagic fevers for humans. So this is a, a blood-related fever in pigs, in swine. Now for a believer like us, in the Bible, because it's in the Bible, it's in Leviticus, it's either, well, I won't go into that, it's Leviticus 7 or 11, uh, that tells us um, eating swine is an, is an abomination. We're not supposed to, it's not food for us. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff online you can go check it out with the diseases that swine carry and the worms and things that they pass on and it's kind of distasteful so being told you can't eat it is kind of like being told you can't pick that roadkill up off the side of the road and eat that thing raw it's okay by me but the swine oh and there's verses oh hang on i think it's isaiah 66 verse 19 that talks about people who are eating the abominations, things like mice and so on, hiding back in the garden, very unclean. Um, there's a lot of associations with, oh yeah, Pastor Joe's building the fire, um, getting the fire pit ready for tonight. We're going to have venison stew in the Dutch oven. Um, the associations between people and pigs, and in the eyes of a believer like us, people making themselves unclean, defiling themselves with this pork, with things like bacon and, the, you know, the explosion of bacon in the cooking world in the last year or two where there's bacon ice cream and bacon coffee and bacon whatever, mm, bacon. right? It's, it's just permeating. And the whole um, advertising where pork is the other white meat, you know, chicken, pork. And the other thing about pig and pork is it's cheap so if you're on a budget and you're trying to you know get protein in your diet and have flavor in your food if you're not a hebrew eating pork would make sense to you like this stuff's pretty cheap a lot of times it's cheap it's definitely cheaper than beef sometimes cheaper than chicken it's readily available um so there's that bit of relation between people and and pigs nowadays modern times there's the relation about i think in the 70s when heart surgery and heart transplant surgery was becoming a thing in the medical world one of the options that the doctors tried was to put a pig's heart in a person 
and see if that would work. And I think they lived a couple of months and then their body rejected it or something and the person ended up dying. But imagine that in the eyes of someone like us and God. That's like saying, you know, I took some rotting something and stuck it in a human body. To God, this thing is a temple. So you don't defile it. But I got off key there. So, then there's the swine flu. Swine flu popped up, what, about 80s, 90s? I don't know, sweetie, sometime. You know, be, been around forever. May, maybe the 2000s. But I, I'm pops up in the popular culture, becomes something in the media. They start making a thing about this swine flu. And one of the um, ways it would come about would be people living very closely with their swine, either in the house with them or, you know, walking around in their pens and just daily contact with these unclean, these pigs and their feces and their germs and whatever. Same thing with duck flu or uh, avian flu. Tons of those animals all crowded together and then people interacting with them on a daily basis lots of times. And so the big fear then and the reality that it can happen now is that these um, viruses can jump, fevers can jump from the animal to the human, especially with viruses. Now, when they say um, African hemorrhagic fever, I don't know if that's a, a, a virus or a bacteria. A it's a virus. Viruses mutate. And viruses, when they jump into one host, they mix genetically with you, and they are different when they go to the next host and the next host and the next host. And that's where the worry about a pandemic flu comes from, because this is a possibility. And one screaming example of an, this kind of possibility is the Spanish flu of the time frame around World War I. The, for the longest time, the thought was, and maybe it still is, um, that that fever started near a pig farm in western Kansas. And Kansas. the... Go Kansas. Go Jayhawks. The uh, the postman or someone like that who traveled around the community, you know, visits the pig farm, picks it up from them, takes it into town, transfers it to soldiers because soldiers for World War One were training in that area. The soldiers then, you know, take it to the battlefield and so on and so on. There's also a thought that it came out of Europe, and that's why it's called the Spanish flu. Yeah, but it came out of Kansas. Um, that you had all those soldiers from different countries all training and stationed in a place somewhere, I think in Spain. And they had animals too, because in World War One there was no Walmart. If you were going to eat food, and soldiers have to eat, you'd bring the animals with you. You know, your cooks would have their own kitchens they'd set up in the field, and they'd butcher the cow or the pig or the duck or the goose right there and cook it up for you guys the same day. So you have all these animals and all these people all together on an army um, base, and there's lots of units from Spain and England and France and so on all together, and that, that soup right there causes the virus to outbreak, and then they spread it around and so on and so on. Either way, you can see a theme right there. Lots of animals crowded together, lots of people crowded around with the animals. Now, the situation, we come to what we're talking about dealing right now, right now. Nobody knows anything about North Korea. Or if, they're, if they do, what they know about North Korea is not crucial to them. They're looking at the military side of things. You know, do they have a nuke? Are they going to nuke somebody? Excuse me. Excuse me. And there are people who keep their eye on the social side of North Korea, but because North Korea is wanting their borders closed and they don't want anybody interfering, then it's very hard to, you know, get that information. North Korea uses swine, pigs, as a huge part of their protein. They don't run cattle. It's very cold up there. Um, cattle need a lot more food. You can keep pigs on very poor ground. Um, they put on weight very quickly. You know, they go from whatever the piglet is, I don't even know, 20 pounds to uh, within a year or two, they're 300 pounds. So you're getting a lot of meat on, on your investment. 
the countries around North Korea, uh, I think it's specifically China and South Korea, have had cases of this African hemorrhagic swine flu on the borders of North Korea. At least a dozen pigs, I think South Korea said. And they have a, I, I forget how far apart their two borders are, but they have an area between the two countries where neither one of them goes. DMZ. And do you know how wide that is? Uh, I, sh I really should, but no, it's not that wide. It's like, you know, 10 or 20 miles, something like that. Right, so many miles. I, I think I may have read four miles. Yeah, maybe. And in that in-between area, there's, you know, there's wild animals. No one's out there hunting them. No one goes there. So these Nothing but landmines and spoff. Right, and they're just, they're just running around out there. Well, these pigs. Wild pigs. Wild pigs are running in there. And these wild pigs transferred the, this African hemorrhagic fever to the South Korean pigs and to some Chinese pigs. And the number of them that have transferred it makes their South Ooh. Korea think that North Korea may have a much larger number of their swine infected. And so South Korea has treated a certain, I think it was 250 miles or something of the border between their country and North Korea to keep that flu from being able to cross. Um, but the speculation is, based on what they know, is that there could be 80% of the pigs in North Korea have this swine flu. So they did show a picture of people in protective gear with some sort of uh, fence around a number of pigs. So there's a possibility there of a pandemic swine flu bursting out of North Korea into the countries bordering it. And that becomes a, a uh, concern for anyone who's looking for signs of, of problems that this, that swine flu, if it's big, you know, if it's jumping from pig to pig to pig and then country to country to country, that it makes the jump into people. And then you've got a pandemic swine flu in people. And that's a problem. Why is that a problem? Because these viruses, these flus, can be voracious. They can be, because they're mutating all the time. There's mild forms and there's very severe forms. With the flu of the 1914, the Spanish yeah. flu, the cases that people got in, I believe it was the fall, was sort of mild, but then when it re-emerged in the spring, it was voracious, and it could kill people within 12 hours. And it attacked the lungs, and what would happen is the body would send a lot of fluid to the lungs to, to try to deal with what was happening in there, and they would basically drown. And it would happen very quickly. So the fear of a flu pandemic like that is the, how quickly it spread. And that flu killed, I think, 50 million people worldwide. It was really serious. Now, on the flip side of that, for us, there was no aspirin in those days. There were no antibiotics in those days. Uh, we have different ways of treating medicine now, much more advanced ways of treating things than we did then. We know more about viruses. Um, the dried elderberry and vodka tincture is a thing that's supposed to fight viruses and there's even a, a commercial variety of a dried elderberry that. cough syrup called Sambacol and Walmart carries it and other people. So we, we have had some advances in science to fight something like a pandemic flu but it would still put a lot of people out of commission and it would strain resources and populations would be uh, lessened as something like that came through. So that's why it's important to us. What can you do? The number one thing that will help you in a pandemic like that is isolation. The, oh, yeah. the villages, the towns that when the Spanish flu was coming through said nobody comes in or out of our town, they had the higher rate of survival than people who were going back and forth, back and forth in cities and so on and carrying carrying it along with them. So isolation, quarantining is one of the number one things you can do if a thing like a flu, a pandemic is in your area. Second thing is have stocks of med medicine. Have stocks of things like antibiotics, um, fluids, IVs if you can get them. Um, you're going to want a lot of linens, 
uh, fever reducing medicines, um, bacteria fighting medicines, garlic, honey, olive oil, all the natural and medicinal plants and, and teas and everything. Um, because once someone has it, you cannot, it's not like a bacteria. If it's bacteria, the antibiotic will kill that bacteria right away. But if it's not, all you're doing is treating their symptoms. So what your treatment for your person who has this illness would be is supportive. Make sure they're hydrated, try to keep their fever down, try to control their body temp, um, strengthen their immune system. That's what you can do. So keep your eye on that guy, you guys. Thanks for, for uh, watching, and we're going to continue to enjoy Sukkot. I hope you do too. Shalom.